friends to Rosedale Community Church and our online message. Yes, I'm recording it today because unfortunately my audio didn't work, but this is the last in our series on love and relationships, and so I really wanted to get the message to you. So I'm hoping that this recording does work and I can upload it. Well, over the past few weeks, we've been exploring love and relationships. We've looked at what the Bible says about how to love well those folk who are in our lives. And I don't know about you, but I have really found it a very precious, beautiful and helpful series. Today is our final sermon. And honestly, I would be remiss in my faithful handling of God's word and in my duty as a pastor if I were to ignore the fact that love whilst it brings us to heights of joy and wonder and we love falling in love and showing love to other people, it does also make us vulnerable to pain. And so today I'm looking at love and loss and how to live again. Now I have here with me four objects that are reminders of significant loves in my life that I've lost. Yes, there's been many more losses, but these are four big ones for me. The first is this little bear. This little bear that I bought when I lost a baby to miscarriage. A little one that I will never hold in my arms, that I will never know, a life that was precious to me, that I was already in love with. And when the miscarriage came, I had to say goodbye to someone I'd never met. So this little bear reminds me of the life that I never knew. I have another one. Those of you who track with me will know that my dad died a couple of years ago. And um, this here, this here is a picture that reminds me of my dad. It's probably backwards on the film, so I'll just um, say, it says, I think, therefore I am confused. And um, this was a picture that I actually bought my dad as a child, and he kept it for decades. And this was an in-joke. And um, he actually stuck this up on the wall of his toilet his favourite room in the house. And so when he died, I, I'm taking this. This is going to remind me um, of my relationship with my dad. So this is an in-joke and what I keep for him. I have something else here. And this here is a very precious, beautiful ring. It's my engagement ring. And this is reminds me of the husband that I loved and lost, the husband who left me. And so that was a very significant loss in my life. And then finally, my fourth item, my running trainers. My running trainers, because I've lost the ability to run. I have a damaged back um, and the disc means that I cannot do high impact exercise. I can no longer run. Now I'm gonna be honest with you, losing my running, okay, it's not a significant like person relationship, but I loved running and I have probably cried as much about the fact that I can no longer run as I cried about losing my dad. And so I wonder if you can relate to these, if you can relate to some of these loves and losses. I wonder what yours are. You know, it might be something that you had and has now gone, or perhaps it's someone or something that you desperately wanted and never came to pass. All of us will have different losses. And I hasten to add, it is not a competition. Now, the very nature of loss is that we lose something that's precious to us. And so then, of course, we're going to grieve and we should do. We should grieve. But to stay locked in the depths of grief is not where the Lord wants us to be indefinitely. And that's why this message today is called Love, Loss and Life. And I want to us to turn to a character in the Bible who walked this very journey. And this character is um, a lady called Naomi, and her story is found in the book of Ruth. So I'm going to read Ruth chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the, mount in the country of Moab. The man's name was Limelech. His wife's name was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Mahlon and Kilion. They were Aphrodites, and they went from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. 
after they had lived there about 10 years, both Mahlon and Kilion also died. And Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. Oh, what a terrible, terrible situation. Naomi lost her husband and both of her sons. And obviously she's going to be devastated by her loss. And we know that we can, we hear and we can read how she's feeling. Because a bit later, this is what, this is what it says. Verse 19. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women exclaimed, can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she said to them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So you can really hear in these words how devastated Naomi is by her loss. Her nearest and dearest, her husband and her two sons have died and she has lost everything. She says, I have lost everything and she's in the depths of despair. So much so that she changes her name from Naomi, which means pleasant, to Mara, which means bitter. She is bitter. She is angry. And who is she angry at? She's angry at God. She's angry at God, she's bitter, she's depressed, she cannot see anything beyond her own pain. Her grief is real, really real. And, and it should be. When we lose somebody that we love, we should grieve. Jesus did. When, when his best friend Lazarus died, he stood at the grave and wept. And so we should too. And this, this is our first top tip. First top tip in love, loss and life is that we need to grieve. Grief is the young widow trying to raise three children alone. Grief is the father who walks past the cemetery every morning before work. Grief is turning to begin a conversation just to remember that there's no one there. Grief is the silent terror that strikes each night when you face the dark alone. Grief is not having someone to kiss goodbye when you walk out the front door. We should feel that. Some people try to handle grief by ignoring it, by stuffing it down, by avoiding being reminded by it. You know, and, and that's not helpful. It's really not, because if you don't grieve, then all these big emotions get stuck inside and you can become ill, or one day you won't be able to contain it anymore and you'll just explode, or both. I mean, that's a very simplified um, um, description of what happens, but there are many studies done, studies done of people who've stuffed down their feelings and what happens to them. They become ill, they become twisted, it turns on the inside, or they just explode in anger or, or, or desperation, and life gets even worse. But the point is that you are allowed to grieve and you should feel. The power of feeling is that you feel all these feelings and handle them and get to the other side. If you don't feel, that's what leaves you tied up in bondage. So Naomi was angry. And you know what? You're allowed to be angry. The Bible says, in your anger, do not sin. It doesn't say sin is, uh, anger is a sin. It doesn't say that. It says, in your anger, do not sin. You can express your anger. You can tell God you're angry with him. I mean, he's big enough to take it. He really is. You're allowed to be hurt, sad and depressed. You're allowed to cry and to yell. I mean, one of the reasons that I love the Bible is so much is that it's raw, it's real. And in the scriptures, we are given this wonderful set of, of songs, of poems called the Psalms that help us express ourselves when we haven't got the words. And many of those Psalms are Psalms of lament. And I find these really helpful. I mean, I'm going to no, just listen, listen to a few words from Psalm 6. This is one of the Psalms of Lament. Listen to this. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I am faint. Heal me, Lord, for my bones are in agony. My soul is in deep anguish. How long, O oh Lord, how long? Turn, Lord, and deliver me. Save me because of your unfailing love. Among the dead, no one proclaims your name who praises you from the grave. And I am worn out from my groaning. All night long, I flood my bed 
with weeping and drench my, my couch with tears. My eyes grow weak with sorrow. They fail because of all my foes. I mean, those are real words. My bones hurt. I cry. I'm in despair. I'm worn out from all my groaning. These are words of love and loss of grief. Friends, it's good to grieve. And as time goes on, do we not find that grief changes? <clears throat> I mean, in psychology, this is kind of recognised that there are various stages of grief or perhaps cycles of grief might be a better term because we tend to go round and round and round them, you know, but it does. The process of grief changes, you know, there's there's denial, there's anger, there's depression, you know, and then you kind of try and bargain with God and bargain with life until you come to a point of accepting they've gone they've gone. We would like it to be a smooth process, but in truth, grief is usually rather chaotic, isn't it? But the good thing is that grief is supposed to become less intense or conflicted. That doesn't mean you forget the person. Of course not. Or the situation. That will never go away. Grief will never be completely over. But a good sign of life and healing is that it no longer consumes all your thinking. Or maybe your days, your actions and behaviours are no longer completely ruled by your grief. Now, some people never reach this place. So powerful are their feelings of loss over someone or something that they've loved that they, they actually want to keep hold of it and want it to consume all their thoughts and feelings. I'm sure you've probably met folk who seem to be so stuck in that dark pit of grief. However, that's not God's intention. God's intention is life. He actually says, I've come to bring life, life in all its fullness. And so at some point, at some point, if we want to pursue life, we need to choose people and places where we can find joy and peace. And this is top tip number two. Top tip number two. Where do you go to find a place where you can live again, where there may be the possibility of joy and peace. For Naomi, it was returning to her hometown in Bethlehem. She was still grieving, but somehow she knew that the right place, the place where she needed to be, was in the company of all those that, that she had grown up with. And so she returned to Bethlehem, to her hometown, to do her grieving and to face life. What is our right place? Who are the people that we need to be with? It will be, it will be individual. So what is your place where you can begin to see life and joy and peace? Is it walking in nature or a coffee or a meal with a friend? Is it possibly beginning a new hobby or rediscovering one that you used to love? Maybe you want to join a sports group or a craft club or a, a choir. And of course, coming to church to worship being with your brothers and sisters who will mourn with you when you mourn and will rejoice with you when you rejoice, being with the God who understands grief, who will weep with you too. Find a place or a people, whatever it is, where you can begin to know joy and peace again because that's what God has got for you. He doesn't want you stuck in the dark pit of despair. He wants you to start living, living again. One of my favourite verses of scripture is Isaiah 61. Actually, we talk about this quite a lot in our household. And Isaiah 61 was written for the exiles to give them hope for a new life after they've been taken into captivity and now they were going to start life again. So they had spent 70 years grieving the loss of, of their life and nation and Israel. And, and God says this to them. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. 
They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Isn't that beautiful? That the Lord comes to bind up the brokenhearted. The Lord says, I'm here to comfort those who mourn. I am here to provide for those who are grieving. And where you feel that your life is in ashes, actually, I'm going to give you a crown of beauty. There's going to be praise instead of despair. And instead, life is going to be like a beautiful big oak tree that grows strong, strong and lives. Jesus came that we may have life and life in all its fullness. And life is complicated. It's a complicated mixture of pain and joy. Let it be both. And some folk need to hear that today so they can begin to live again. You know, that that there is going to be pain. You're not going to forget that. But there is also life. And there's life and there's joy and there's peace. This is what happened to Naomi. Naomi, those of you who, who remember the story, She headed home with Ruth. That's why this book is called Ruth. Ruth, her daughter-in-law, the widow of one of her sons. And Ruth, the Moabite, returns home with her to Bethlehem. And there a whole new life starts. And it's a beautiful story of love and romance and hardship and and God providing. But listen, listen to these words. This is from Naomi's perspective. Okay, who we're looking at today. Naomi had lost her husband and sons and everything. This is what it says at the very end of Ruth chapter four. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive and she gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, praise be to the Lord who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better than seven sons has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The woman living there said, Naomi has a son. And they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now, this is really interesting because we need to note, I mean, this child that was born um, wasn't actually a direct descendant from her. It wasn't from her body. Okay, this was Boaz, who was a kinsman redeemer, a a distant relative. And this is Ruth, who was her daughter-in-law. And yet it's very clear in scriptures that that, that Naomi becomes the grandmother she never thought she would be. For Naomi, this life comes not of her body, but as good as. And fantastically, beautifully, she becomes part of a far greater story, a story that she's not going to live to tell. It's unlikely that she was still alive um, when David was born, who would become King David. And she certainly had no clue that her story was going to be included in the ancestry of Jesus the Messiah. But Naomi had a part to play in this story. And here we are, all these thousands of years later, talking about the life that came after her loss. And so Naomi and all of her neighbours, they recognise God's blessing and they praise him. And this is top tip number three. Count your blessings. Yes, I know it sounds old fashioned, but there's a reason for that. There is a reason why this wonderful spiritual blessing has stood the test of time. Count your blessings. Say, thank you, God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I am so grateful. It changes you. In modern day language, you might want to call this keeping a gratitude diary. What does that mean? Well, every day, just before you go to sleep, instead of ending the day of, oh, I'm so tired, I'm exhausted, I'm in pain, I've been hurting, this has been bad, this has been bad, this isn't going right, I'm hurt. Instead of doing that, you end the day jotting down three things that you are grateful for from that day. Three things. Even better if you've got a family and you all gather together for the evening meal, you know, have everybody share a good thing from the day that they're thankful for. Okay, it's really hard to say thank you and I am grateful without just beginning to smile 
okay just beginning to smile and this will help you realize that there is life life after loss you know there's that saying isn't there that my attitude will determine my altitude and if my attitude is one of gratitude then my altitude will be high so number three count your blessings now folks I'm going to finish and I'm going to speak bluntly and I really hope you don't equate that with me being callous because truthfully I understand the pain of loss but also truthfully what is gone is gone. None of us can get it or them back again. Yes those loved ones who've gone on before us we will meet again in heaven but in this life right now what is gone is gone. Last week I was attending um, an online course and this quote came up. Life is 10% what happens to you and 90% what you do with it. I wish it wasn't true. I honestly do. But the fact is, it is true. Folks, what has happened to you has happened to you. And I hope and I pray, pray that where you've loved and lost, you can once again experience life because that is what Jesus offers he says I bind up the brokenhearted and I want you to have life and life in all its fullness and so let's just finish shall we with a prayer where you are able to give to the Lord what it is that you're feeling right now is that your grief is that your pain is that your longing for love is that your longing for new life whatever it is Bring that before the Lord now as we finish with a prayer. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for your love. Thank you that you love us and we can love you. Thank you, Lord God, that you know what it is to lose. Father, you gave up your son. Jesus, you wept at the grave of Lazarus. You know what it is to have the pain of loss. And Father, right now I pray for all those listening and watching that where they have loved and lost, that you will bring in life, new life in all its fullness. And Lord, they will begin to know your joy, your peace and your life for them. What you've got for them for the future, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, folks. Thanks for being with us. We'll see you next week.